Hi, everybody, and welcome to the fourth installation of the R Adoption Series. I am uh, Michael Rimler uh, from GSK, and I'm joined here by uh, uh, my co-lead on the FUSE Working Group, uh, Mike Stackhouse from Matoris Research. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here to talk about this working group. The team has done a lot of really good work, and we want to share that out with those that are that are here on um, on the webinar. Uh, but we really do hope that we can engage in some discussions and learn from your experiences, not just share what what this team has has come up with. Um, we can move to the next slide, Mike, and I will um, go through what we expect for the agenda today. Uh, we'll start with a with an introduction and a background on the project, the Fuse Working Group project, um, and then the meat of the work of the the conversation today is is really focusing on the use cases. Uh, so we'll have Kevin and Brian. Uh, to lead a discussion on uh, the work that they did within linear models. Uh, Minhua and Mia will talk about uh, survival, um, aiming, and Mike will then uh, turn to CMH and we will round out with Andy and Kai on mixed models. Within each section, uh, we hope to do uh, just a short presentation to give a little bit of a background and what some of the key learnings are that each of the sub teams in the use cases have uh, have uncovered, and then and then really engage with you on whether these are um, similar experiences. You have different experiences, questions you might have, um, but hopefully a, a two way conversation. When we were putting this webinar together, I don't know if if, if people here have been to some of the other um, our adoption series uh, events that have happened throughout the year, um, but some have had breakouts and and but and, and some have have not, but. The idea is to try and engage the community and have have discussions. So that's really what we want to spend the, the majority of the time doing. So if you have experience with any of these, please, uh, we encourage you to to engage in that discussion. And then we'll round out with with a little bit of a closing and looking at what the next steps are for the project and how you can get involved. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Mike Stackhouse uh, to go through our introduction and kick us off. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so in beginning this project, um, some of the conversation really focuses on the fact that um, if you're here, you're interested in R, you're interested in um, R and pharma, and you'll have noticed that the mentality and in industry is um, slowly starting to shift from the status quo of doing what we've always done um, and shifting towards using the best tool for the job. And a lot of the discussions over the last few years um, have centered around validation. Um, the going out to conferences and seeing presentations about R, the questions always being, it's not validated, so we can't use it, right? And um, that being the primary focus. But at the, the, a lot of those conversations um, and a lot of the focus of validation around R, we've, we're starting to find solutions, we're starting to find our way with using validated packages and get validated environments set up um, so that we can use them uh, within our GXP environments. So those problems are starting to be solved. But when you start trying to adapt to this, there are new questions that arise because validated packages don't guarantee that your results between SAS or R will agree. And in this group, we're really focusing not just on uh, R, versus, R versus SAS, but the future of the fact that statistical programming languages inherently have different implementations of, uh, of the statistical methods. They, they're written by different authors, they're built from the ground up, and there's a lot of reasons why, why one package might not agree with another package. Um, and it, it's a path that you need to go down to really understand why. Uh, and that's what this group has been exploring. Um, so what we're going to go through today and what we're going to start exploring and demonstrate to you guys and have some discussion around is the venture that we've gone down in this working group, um, but collaborating between the uh, FUSE and the R Consortium of looking at the implementations of a couple different statistical methods uh, and comparing the results between R and SAS and the exploring the different questions that you need to ask as you go through to understand the implementations um, in R, in SAS, and some of the reasons why uh, we're getting discrepant results um, and why the numbers that we see um, in different things don't agree and how we should start handling that and how to answer those questions. 
So clinical statistical reporting in a multilingual world, um, the FUSE working group that this is built on, um, has two overarching goals. So one is to document and build a repository of common analyses that we do in clinical trial data analysis. So looking at some of, um, some of the most common ones that we identified, uh, there's a few different efforts that we, or subgroups um, that we have in here. And um, uh, we've chosen those methods to try to give a couple different variations of use cases that we could explore. Um, but it started by looking at some of the most common analyses that we do in clinical trials that we want to understand um, that'll give us the biggest bang for our buck off the bat. Um, so the in, in this, outlining differences in the implementations of um, initially R versus SAS um, for uh, those statistical methods and documenting differences in capabilities um, and known discrepancies um, between either the package implementations or um, just the capabilities of one language versus the other. And then uh, we also have an effort to build a white paper around this that is, the, and the goal there is to establish a general framework for approaching new analyses. So when you're going to go down this path, um, what is the recommended approach for that investigation? And what are the things that you can uh, expect to encounter along the way? And establishing a framework for effectively communicating those findings or the potential issue areas. Uh, because we, uh, this is something that if we, when we're going into a submission, when we're going to deliver results, um, be it vendor to client, um, be it um, one organization to another, or be it the submitting um, company to the agency, um, how do we how do we outline um, the things that we expect them to encounter, and how how should we communicate these things? Because we're very tip or very used to outlining uh, in uh, our statistical analysis plans that we're going to use SAS nine point four. Um, and maybe going down to the maintenance release. But what are the things that we should expect to have to communicate when we're delivering to the agency or anyone else um, so that they can understand what to encounter um, when they're trying to replicate that analysis in R or in Python or in Julia, what have you. So this project um, has quite a different or quite a few organizations communicating to um, or working on this project. Um, and this is across different pharmaceutical companies, um, participation of vendors, and we have some participation from um, FDA employees as well, um, including academia. Um, so we have a pretty well-rounded base here um, on the project team um, that has come together to work on this. Um, and I've um, both Michael Wormler and I have been very um, pleased with the participation that we've had um, from all these different organizations. So uh, Michael is an economist by training and he's been a programmer by trade. I'm a data scientist, um, but we both know that we don't have the statistical prowess to do this ourselves. Um, and we've gotten a great amount of participation um, from these different representatives uh, to give us that expertise to really ask the educated questions that you need to ask when you go through this effort. The current status of what we're doing um, in the project uh, is that the white paper sub team has kicked off. We've begun um, outlining the initial pieces of that paper and um, expect that to ramp up even more in Q1 2022 as we go into January after the holidays. And we have the proof of concept investigation of four common analyses that uh, Michael outlined in the beginning here that we're gonna walk through um, and open up to discussion today. And those are linear models, uh, CMH, mixed models and survival analysis. Uh, so those have been the four subgroups that we've had some teams break out and independently do this investigation so that we can bring that back together. We have a public GitHub repository for the project content on, um, hosted under the FUSE organization in the repository CSR MLW. And um, so that all these links will be delivered out after the uh, webinar as well um, to each of you so that you can access those. But, um, and we'll go over how you can get involved. But all of the content that we're producing is inherently public. Uh, and as we build up this content, there will be a book down website coming out so that we can deliver that in a more readable and accessible manner. But currently all the work that we've been doing has been taking place within that repository. So if you wanna do a deeper dive after the webinar, uh, then you can go and view that in, on GitHub. So I'll hand that back over to you, Michael, um, so that we can begin these subgroup discussions. Thanks, Mike. Yep. So first, uh, we are going to look into uh, linear models, and we have uh, Kevin and Brian that have prepared uh, a little bit of a, an intro discussion, and then that that's uh, that's where we'd like to 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 bring it to the the wider group uh, to to probe what you've learned or see if you have any 
any questions around linear models. Uh, in this case, again, all of these are, are R versus SAS, but we're also thinking about other languages. So uh, um, Kevin and Brian, I hand to you. Uh, thanks, Michael. So with linear models, uh, we we're starting off with looking at a couple of uh, couple of areas. Uh, the first one is uh, the output that comes out from the R linear model functions. Um, it can be tailored to match the output from the SAS procedures. So that's one of the first things we looked at was um, what tools can we use to do that. And secondly, uh, Kevin Puchko will discuss uh, contrasts in R and how you define them um, in SAS versus R. So uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, so, so in SAS, um, the SAS procedures output, uh, you get your default output, but you can also traverse all the pieces of the output and turn it into a data set using the ODS trace on uh, along with ODS statements uh, to create data sets from pretty much any piece of output in SAS. On the R side, uh, for instance, from the LM AOV functions, uh, you can use a broom package with some functions such as tidy, augment, and glance. Uh, there's an ANOVA function, a summary function you can use with the stat functions, or you can manually traverse the lists and sublists, which are generated by LM and AOV. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just kind of a, a picture <clears throat> of at the top is the proc GLM. Uh, we're using kind of balanced, uh, complete data for the simple model. Uh, the SAS procedures are on the top and the R functions on the bottom and the different colored squares kind of shows uh, the numbers matching up with the numbers from SAS uh, for, this, for this type of model. So this shows that, that we can grab the pieces of our uh, statistical output for linear models from these functions and get similar output to SAS. Uh, next slide, please. And also just looking at all the, the parameter estimates uh, using the solution option on the model statement in GLM, uh, we can use the tidy function and you can see the, uh, the estimates match uh, for the simple linear model. All right, so, so that's all for my part. Next, we're gonna talk about contrast and we can turn it over to Kevin Puchko. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, so contrast in R are defined a little bit differently than they are in SAS, but the results can match. Uh, in some cases, uh, sometimes in many cases. So uh, in SAS, basically all your contrast will be defined manually using either an estimate or a contrast statement. Uh, but in R, there are many, many ways to define a contrast. <laughs> uh, one of the easier ways is to use the contrast argument in one of whatever model function that you are using. And there are some uh, default contrast methods built in, like counter treatment, counter SAS, or counter Helmert, that you can use uh, to quickly do the contrasts that you are looking for. However, uh, there is a package called EM means with its contrast function that, uh, in my experience, I found to be a bit easier to run these contrasts and have them um, match the SAS output. Um, and then, next slide. Next slide, please. Um, but there are some cases where the math uh, that R and SAS does is a little bit different. So in the top uh, example there in SAS running a proc GLM, uh, we have an example of doing uh, a reverse Helmert contrast, basically comparing one level to all prior levels. And in R, if you tried to do the same thing using counter.helmert, you'll see on the right that your estimates differ but your test statistics and p-values are the same. And again, that's just because of some differences in the way R does the math, um, where the estimates are off by a certain uh, factor. 
However, if we do the same thing using the EM means package in the bottom panel there, you can see basic, it's uh, almost a copy and paste of the contrast definition. And then the estimates go on to match that in SAS. Uh, so basically, that's what we've learned uh, in our experiments for comparing R and SAS. And I think at this point, we'll open it up for discussion about any other things that other people have seen or concerns that they might have when working with linear models. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so this format is is somewhat new and also to go with, with Zoom. So please, please bear with us. But if you have um, I, I, my my main question that I want to ask on, on any of these is is what are other people's experience? Have you used have you worked with linear models and looked at comparisons in um, in either implementation or results in R versus SAS? What is your experience? Is it similar to what Kevin and Brian are, are finding? If you have questions or comments, please raise your hand so we know how to un, like allow you the, the ability to talk or, or, or feel free to drop questions into the, into the chat and we'll try and make this as seamless a discussion as we can with our uh, technological limitations. I'm not seeing any hands go up, but I do have a, so, so Brian and, and, and Kevin, I mean, it looks like the takeaway for, for here is that um, in, at least with respect to, to R and SAS implementation of, of linear models, we can, we can do very much the same work. Um, it's clear kind of what the path is and we can even obtain numerical uh, equivalence between the two. Is that, is that right? Is my interpretation right? Uh, uh, yes. So with, with what we showed, it was, um, or at least what, what I showed, it was a kind of a balanced data frame with, with no missing values. Um, as you get into the different or more complex models um, and have missing values in the data, we still have more work to do to document the differences and, and what you may have to do to, to get things to match. Right. And so in some of the uh, functions um, that you can run in R, it may not report all of the output that SAS does. Uh, but with some, you know, unfortunately, some digging and some trial and error with other functions or packages available, you can get those values. Um, or if, you know, if you're not interested in uh, trying to calculate them yourself by hand. And we have some of this written up in the, or we're planning on having it at least written up and, and, and put into our repo so people can see how you've been able to do this, correct? Right, yeah. Um, I do see a question uh, about the rounding issue. It says, was the rounding issue handled pre-calling LM? Um, we didn't, we didn't do any rounding beforehand. And you'll notice the when the out the output gets spit out to the console or in SAS that the rounding will be kind of handled differently based on the display, default display values from the procedure or the function. But if you do save the results off as a data frame or in SAS as a data set, you'll see all the precision there. Um, and it'll go out to, to many more significant digits. So hopefully that answers your question. Do you guys have an understanding um, of why the Helmark contrast uh, from base using the LM function produces the different estimates versus EM means? Um, not. Uh, not a great understanding. From what I uh, could glean, I think that the co co contour helmet, uh, as defined in base R, um, works as a way of uh, I don't need to be involved in uh, sorry, works as a way of um, identifying your levels as 
I think, binary indicators, whereas if you're using it with um, EM means, it allows for something that resembles more of a, a, co a typical contrast definition, where I guess the math behind it um, you know, converts it to fractions. Uh, so it's, I think it's just a difference of linear algebra, and I'm not exactly too sure on what's going on behind the scenes to make that uh, estimate be on a different scale. Very good, thank you. I, sh I should note that that the, the sort of philosophy of the working group. I know no one's brought this up. I'm going to bring it up um, just just because because I want to make a comment on it. Um, you know, we started with the philosophy that we're not questioning the validation level of any of these packages, or the we're, we're simply looking at what's out there and how things compare in this particular use case. And Andy Nichols, you, you put a comment in here about, you know, so I'll just quote it comforting for a linear model that you can get the same results if needed uh, because the math should be pretty standard. That's true. Um, and, and what that says is, is that, you know, based on however a particular organization is gonna establish these packages as being a reliable package, uh, that means that the, the, the move between these two languages uh, at the moment doesn't seem to show any additional challenges towards towards uh, adopting either either language or using them interchangeably uh, and it'll be interesting to see as this type of project moves on whether that's similar in other um, with other languages or, or as we move on to some of the other uh, classification models uh, throughout today uh, any other um, Discussion questions or, or comments again. Feel free to, to to raise your hand so we can give you the the, the ability to come off mute and actually uh, interact. This the, the the platform doesn't allow that to be done easily uh, at the moment. But if you raise your hand, we can definitely uh, do that or or drop a question in the chat. All right. Well, Brian and, and Kevin, thank you very much for coming today and, and presenting on the work that you've done within within the linear models. Um, we can move to uh, the next slide, Mike. Uh, and this will be survival analyses uh, from Minhua and, and Mia. Uh, there was a FUSE single day event uh, earlier this, this very recently. I don't want to say earlier this year, very recently because it was it was later in the year. Uh, that presented the work uh, that was done here uh, in in a lot more depth than than uh, what might be initially presented uh, right now. Um, but on the survival, I will hand it over to uh, Mia and Minwa uh, to lead a discussion on what they've been finding within survival. Thank you, Michael. Um, so so for the survival analysis, because there exist many survival models and uh, we cannot just compare every model. So the first step we tried was to identify the most commonly used survival models in clinical trials. Uh, could you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So generally Cox model and uh, kaplan mirror methods are the most standard methods in survival analysis. So this is the mock-up table we usually use when we report uh, survival analysis results. Uh, the layout might vary uh, among therapeutic areas or companies, but the contents uh, here should be very similar if you do a uh, standard survival analysis in clinical trials. So the first uh, uh, rows are just uh, the number percentage of events or sensors, so they are just proportions. And the next chunk are the quartile estimates and the landmark estimates. And uh, these uh, quartile estimates and the landmark estimates are based on the kaplan meier methods. So the, the last two rows include the hazard ratio and the p-value. So these are used to compare the survival between two treatment arms. And the hazard ratio uh, comes from the Cox proportional hazards model and the p-value uh, usually it comes from the log gram test. Um, could you move up to the key takeaway slide, please. Oh, move up, please, to the key takeaway slide. Ah, there we ah, are. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
So, thank you. So, after identifying the survival models, we want to compare. We then try several data sets uh, with different scenarios. The results may not match between us and R. It may do attribute to different implementation of algorithms, or the may due to uh, data. So, if we observe the discrepancies, we uh, we also try to explore the. Uh, reasons for these uh, discrepancies. So for most of the time, actually, R and SAS give identical results. If they are not identical, uh, we found that there could be two reasons. The first reason is due to different default choices. Uh, for example, and the, the, the second reason, I, I go to the example next, and the, the second reason could be different algorithm or implementations of common algorithm. So for example, uh, for uh, the different default choices, um, Michael, could you please move to the next slide? Next one, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, thank you. So uh, for example, the default tie handling method in R is called Ephraim. The default and the default option in SAS for hand, tie handling is called Breslau. So if ties exist in the data set, the hazard ratio and its confidence interval could be slightly different if you use R or SAS's default method. Uh, Michael just showed a side-by-side -side comparison of R results and SAS results at the beginning of this presentation. And uh, in that slide, those discrepancies were indeed due to this default uh, uh, tie handling reason. And uh, these both uh, SAS and R's default uh, options are valid methods. So although the default methods are different, you can easily change the default options. Um, SAS has this, uh, R's default method, Avron. R also has SAS default method, Birth Law. So after the changing, after changing the default options, you could see in this slide that these results are identical. And uh, could you move to next slide, please? Thank you. And the other possible reason we found uh, uh, that the discrepancy may occur by different algorithms or different implementations of common algorithms. So this discrepancy is highly dependent on data. So you might see the discrepancy in one data set, but might not see the discrepancy if you use another data set. So for example, this data set has 10 observations. So the first five observations are all events and the rest of five are all censored. So for the median estimate, you could say that uh, they are diff SAS and R give different results. And the, the reason is because there are several time points having meet, having the exactly 50% survival probability. You can see it from the Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, in general, for the median estimate, the R and SAS use the same logic. However, when the data meets certain conditions like this data, so there could be slight differences in the algorithm. So you will see the discrepancies. Uh, there's also another case. It, depends on how you write the SAS code and uh, if the data meets certain conditions and due to the time constraint, we did not list here, but it can be found in the GitHub repo. Uh, so in, in, in conclusion, in general for survival analysis, because the Caucus model and the Kaplan-Meier method, they are very standard models in survival analysis. So most of the time are in the SAS give identical results. Uh, for the cases, they don't provide the exact, exact numbers, especially if it's due to the default methods. Uh, even if they are, they are uh, dif slightly different, they are generally consistent when rounded to level necessary for statistical uh, interpretation. Uh, for the second reason, if they are caused by different algorithm or different implementation of common algorithms, as it usually happens to small sample data sets. So whatever the estimate we get or whatever uh, software we use, we tend to interpret those statistics with caution. And more details and more examples in the R codes and SAS code can be found in the GitHub repository. Um, and that's, that's all my presentation. Uh, we can open up for discussion and the questions. Thanks. Thanks, Mia. Um, 
Andy Nichols had put a question in the chat uh, with respect to language agnostic goal in mind. Have we tried changing the options in SAS to match the R defaults? And, and it, this is exactly an example of that that we see in the survival with the defaults of the tiebreaking methods of Efron and Breslow, right? That, that mm -hmm. they each have the two, these two particular languages and their implementations have this, the same, in this case, the same set of options available with a different default set. And with understanding that and setting the, the, the um, options the way that you want them, you can get, in this case, numerical equivalency, at least to a certain level of significance. Yes, uh, in, in reality, because right now, uh, at least in my company, the most uh, the 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 outputs are um, generally still best based on SAS. So we, if, when we try to validate those uh, uh, SAS results, we we tend to uh, change the options in R to match SAS default to see the identical results. Uh, as I mentioned, both options are actually correct, but uh, uh, for the validation purpose, we, 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 we still want to see the identical results. So we will, uh, we would change the default uh, in our SAS to match the other software's results. And, and I think I want to identify here that this is one of the motivations that, in, that, that Mike and I had for wanting to get this project going and get results like this because uh, to, to, to everybody on the call that for those that have that have worked in in survival analysis uh, particularly these these types within within pharma um, you know, have you ever thought about which tie breaking method was more appropriate for your particular analysis uh, ha, ha, what are what are people's thoughts are around this? Um, I mean, I have, there's a motivation behind my question, but I'm curious to know, has anybody ever actually said we should be using Efron or we should be using Breslow? Um, yeah, I think uh, um, from my experience, uh, uh, as. I mentioned that both the methods are valid methods. We usually don't uh, specify which uh, method we want to use. We tend to use the default methods in, in, in SAS. Uh, however, I do notice that for the for this tie handling, so there's some uh, literature thing that uh, if the data has many ties, Ephron is more accurate than birth law. So it's in my, uh, it's recommended to use the Efron method, uh, but most of the time in, in, in practice for the clinical trials, we don't say so many ties. So either option uh, should provide a very close results. So we can just choose uh, either one of them. So, so that's my uh, um, my perspective from my my experience. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that that what uh, our motivation in this in this project part of it is to start to uncover those differences. We haven't ever put two languages next to each other historically, right? It's only been started to happen over the last couple of years as there's been a large kind of um, uh, momentum towards towards R in parallel with with SAS for clinical trial analysis. So as we do that, we're starting to uncover these and and perhaps these questions that need to be asked at least to be to be just to be to be demonstrated of why you would choose Efron versus Breslow and and to say you're choosing one because it was the default in SAS and that's the way we've always done it is not a statistical rationale for doing that. You've provided a statistical rationale that if you have a large number of ties, one method is preferred over another. And so that provides motivation of why you would choose a particular option in this case. And what this project is hoping to uncover is where those differences are, understand where those differences are, so that the those that are defining the analysis and, and, and scoping the analyses can make informed decisions on, in this case, which option to use and why. Also, to be transparent to any Third party reviewer, for example, a regulatory agency that's going to be interpreting those results. Yeah. And Michael, um, to that point, um, 
we also have uh, work on coming up some sort of the algorithm or flow chart for, to help people when you go through this kind of discrepancy that will help you to try to identify where things are, which um, for the cases that maybe haven't been um, haven't been found out in, in terms of discrepancy, but there are discrepancy there. So I think those will be part of the effort that we're going to put through in our white paper. So just kind of give people a bit of heads up on further development that we, we will provide. Very good, thanks. Thanks, Noab. We do have a, we have a couple of questions in the chat, one from Nikhil about which one provides more accuracy, which I think uh, has been addressed, at least with respect to when there's a lot of, a lot yeah. of ties. I don't know if you want to add any more um, con uh, context to, to that or not. Whether I guess well, I, I guess it's with whether SAS or R provides more accuracy. But what you were finding, at least, to was to a certain level of precision, they were both fairly accurate, right? Uh, yes, yes, they yeah, are both accurate uh, at, uh, most of the time. And uh, yeah, it, the, those methods really depends on data, but. Um, as, as, yeah, as I said, if there are many ties, Efron is more accurate than Bird's law. Um, but um, um, in most of the time, those methods do not differ that much. They, they both provide the accurate results. Thank you. And we'll I'm having a tough time finding the attendees. Kieran Martin has a has a question, and I want to try and provide the opportunity to come off mute, but I'm not finding him. So I want to encourage more discussion. Uh, if I can't identify him then in the chat, which I cannot, then I'll just ask the question. Uh, Kieran says, I think one of the most challenging results to justify can be where one software calculates an estimate and the other provides a missing value. Um, you have some of that here on this particular screenshot. What what yeah. what are your thoughts around around this issue? Uh, yes, this is yeah. This is because this data is you know you see it has a very special pattern and also it's a, a, a small data set with only ten observations. So you see these are slightly different. And in in practice, uh, when we see this small data set and we see this Kaplan mirror curve, uh, either we we see the media of a value or the media of a not a evaluable. We we tend to interpret these results in in, in caution. Be, uh, so I for, for for this data set, I would say um, both are both are correct, uh, and uh, it really uh, depends on. Um, uh, so so. Uh, this is because this is the uh, simulated data. So in practice, we we don't see this special pattern usually. So um, most most of the case, these results will be identical. And uh, uh, for this special data, yeah, I would just I would still say this both uh, the numbers are correct, and uh, whatever the the numbers are, we we. Uh, we need to pay attention to to the data with this uh, with this shape. Thank you. Any other questions for um, for me or Minhua on the experiences so far with survival with R versus SAS? Do you want to dig I into Andy's question? Well, uh, he sort of answered his own question, but the question says, yeah, sure, this is a bit philosophical, but do we need to change results to get an exact match in your prop compare? An explainable difference is, is surely OK. Um, from, a, from, from your perspectives, uh, Mia and Minhua, what, what do you think about, about this uh, issue? Uh uh, yeah, I agree with Andy that um, the as long as the difference uh, is explainable, it's it's okay. We accept the uh, differences for for this uh, for this. Yeah, we we 
uh, we do accept uh, this uh, dis um, uh, discrepancies, and we we uh, from from our perspective, we think the uh, they are both correct numbers. Uh, however, when sometimes we we really need to validate the results uh, of the other software, uh, we still would want to change the. Uh, the options to try to match with the other software's results, and uh, in, uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's my my understanding. Meanwhile, do you have anything to add? No, I think yeah, it's it's probably also to do with um, when you kind of comes to the situation and you submit it um, your your uh, submissions and and maybe there's a different software just use between the UN and the organization, then the, the, we also trying to cover that, the trying to explain that discrepancy. So um, so hope that ex, exp, hope that answer kind of that this question as well. The the need of trying to get them matched. Yeah. So Nik Nikhil offers a, a follow-up question. How can we document that validator difference? I think one, one thing that Andy's put in here is, uh, is, is an interesting way to do it, which is through a sensitivity analysis to kind of run them both ways and show that, that numerical match. Um, I would also think that it may be um, difficult to, to demonstrate it in an, in an, in an auto-compare type type way it depends on the situation but you also have the ability to like for example if you're running proc compare to let to, to change the criteria and, and that to, to still show that there's a, a a small difference between those results um mia minwa have you put any thought into how you might document the difference when when validating if there is a difference in, this, in those statistics yeah yeah um, okay, so I think it's probably start with like when you are really um, just not not just um, um, documenting those discrepancy, but also kind of think more ahead of um, when you kind of comes up with this uh, CSR and, and and you are trying to do a sub and you would um, also document it in the way of what would be the most appropriate what's the default what would be the algorithm to answer your research question so with that series then you would have everything transparent and so when it comes to the result then you would kind of might expect some differences um, based on what has been found by others or maybe from your own team so i think looking more ahead uh, of being transparent being documented not just on the result end is it's very mm. critical yeah 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 i totally agree with minhua we, we could specify those uh, uh methods for like for example 10 handling in the setup to uh, uh to specify the uh, the master beforehand uh yeah i totally agree with her Very good, thank you. I want to, uh, and thank you for, for taking the time today to, to present. I want to move on to the uh, the next uh, use case sub team on, on the agenda, which is uh, which is CMH, and we have uh, Aiming and Mike here to to give us a tour of what we've uh, been working on in that space. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so. The CMH sub team has had some interesting findings and um, th this table here is a little bit representative of uh, what that is. And it's that with the analyses that SAS puts forth um, related to CMH, there's really no one solution that meets every requirement within the R package ecosystem. So there, with um, things like general association and the MH odds ratio, the Mandelheim test function from BASAR in the stats package um, satisfies those. Um, and to start getting into some of the other pieces of the analysis, uh, there are other packages available. Um, but there are some pros and cons to each of those. And um, that's part of what this uh, group has gone through in um, their analysis and breaking down these packages. Um, but there are some problematic scenarios that have come up here um, from what the, this group has explored, I'm not going to walk through here. 
Um, so when you look at the CMH test, um, and uh, so what pops out of SAS using PROC Freak, um, you have these different alternate hypotheses that um, offer the degrees of freedom, the value and the probability um, for the p-value in there. Um, and to get that general association, like I just displayed on the last slide, um, you have the Mandelheim um, test function that can achieve that for you. Um, one of the things that um, I personally found in my experience when my team at Atoris went through and replicated the CDISC pilot using R um, is that in the SAP, um, the plan states that treatments will be compared for the overall differences in the cochrane mantle hansel test um, and using the alternate hypothesis uh, um, in SAS as rho means differ. And I'm going through and trying to replicate this with the Mandelheim test function, that alternate hypothesis isn't available. And in the exploration, I'm trying to find what is available to achieve that in R, I came across the VCD extra um, package. And this was a little bit of an interesting um, dive uh, that we had to do to get the replication to work. Um, so in going down and replicating, I did find that there were some errors that I encountered using the CDISC pilot data and um, digging into the GitHub issues with VCD Extra um, because it is a public package and hosted on GitHub so that you can dive into the source code. Um, there are, um, there's a note that for large sparse tables with many strata, um, the CMH test um, function will occasionally throw an error using the solve.default ABA um, from uh, referencing into the source code of that. Um, so the author there actually offered a solution um, at which the um, VCD Extra author had a little bit of an issue implementing um, because there would need to be additional testing to make sure that it works in different data scenarios. Um, but in the replication of the CSIS pilot, I implemented the solution and was able to replicate and get the exact values from the CSIS pilot. I'm um, originally going back done um, in SAS back to 2006 or so. Um, that has some concerns though, because that doesn't really hold up well for the validated environments um, that we use in um, our clinical environments because I had to pull the package, I had to um, make an update to the source code, um, which creates a whole maintenance loop um, of that that you need to consider. Um, so it might not be the best choice for a validated environment. Furthermore, um, as the team dug through um, and they were using um, and testing out VCD Extra um, in a couple different scenarios, um, they also found some other problems in the package with the way that types were specified um, in leading or some inconsistencies that they found with degrees of freedom and the resulting p-values. Um, so there, um, this is all outlined in the documentation that they produced. But if we dig into the key takeaways um, from CMH, um, that uh, what they found that to match some of the SAS, SAS outputs, more than one R package is needed. Um, while VCD Extra offers uh, some of the most um, Let's say some of the best or some of the most consistent comparisons back to SAS. Um, there's a little bit, there's the maintenance concern with that. So the most methodology or methodologically mature package um, is VCD Extra, um, but it's likely not stable enough um, for validated environments. And um, it's interesting in the fact that a lot of the design of VCD Extra is actually to try to replicate um, some of the results presented um, by SAS. But I'm um, looking at the R, um, looking looking in R and the packages available, one of the notes that um, the team here had to offer was that R packages are um, a lot more sensitive towards methodologically questionable designs um, and data proportions. Um, so R speaks out when there are some concerns with the integrity of the results that are um, that are being put forth. So you'll get some warnings and notes. Um, of uh, questionable design, whereas when that rep or when that um, data are run through Proc Freak and um, generated using um, the CMH option, there there's no notes given to you. Um, so R speaks out a little bit more to tell you that hey, um, maybe th these numbers might not um, hold up, um, and it's a little bit more uh, verbose um, in that sense. And then the last piece here was just to consult the documentation um, for um, each R function and um, comparing back to CMH, uh, you really need to understand what are the options being chosen here. So for example, I think it was with the Mandelheim.test function, um, correct is set to false by default. Um, and uh, when you run proc freak and use the options there, um, the, there's no correction or there, there is correction being done so that you need to flip that to true. Um, to get those results to match. So um, like we've been finding with a lot of these packages, when the, um, they're developed independently, 
uh, by different authors, there's different defaults chosen. Um, so that's one of the big things that you really need to explore are what are the decisions that have been made for this analysis? Why has it been made? Um, and so trying to understand what was the author thinking when they um, produced this function and gave us the parameters that we have available um, and how do we configure those to get the results that we wanna get? Not necessarily to match the other language, but um, understanding the defaults that were chosen in each of those languages. So um, that really harps back to um, here of um, CMH is one package that has a lot of different implementations uh, chosen. So these are the three packages that uh, the sub team um, with Clara, Aiming, and Matthew um, Kumar uh, put together uh, that they thought kind of uh, addressed the most of the scenarios, um, or most consistently address the scenarios. I'd be interested to hear from the audience um, any other exploration that they've done internally um, and findings that they've had um, with trying to do CMH and R. Thanks, Mike. Any, um, any questions from, from people around the work that that um, that has been going on within CMH in this case with R R versus SAS or any experience yourself that, that you may have had, uh, whether it's R or or otherwise. So then I will ask a, a question. Um, like how, how would you how how would you recommend if if you know someone's looking to 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 report out uh, with these tests um, and they they they're uh, they're specifying their their analyses and they've traditionally used let's say SAS uh, to report out uh, how what would what would you recommend as the approach to take uh, if they're going to be doing this using are. Um, I think it really comes down to defining um, the cases that you're trying to produce um, and understanding the approach that's best for that. Um, so I, I've seen some different organizations um, detailing the, the functions that they want to use to do different pieces. Um, so in those regards, um, it might be a matter of choosing um, the specific use cases and um, for for example, at VCD Extra, in this case, didn't produce a wrong result when you made the fixes. Um, so maybe that's something that you um, pull in the specific use case and defend that for yourself. Um, and there's, with the way that our packages are designed, um, there's a lot of flexibility in how you can do that. But um, I think part of what we're trying to do here is to help outline um, the best options for that. So. Um, I one of the reasons that I put this table front and center um, is because the, um, the team gave a really great representat or representation here um, of the different pieces of CMH analysis that you might want to do and um, the tools that are available to do that. Um, um, and understanding the, um, the scope um, of those as well, like the notes here that um, the Mandelheim test works um, well for two by two by K um, or that the epi display MHOR function, um, the odds ratios are limited to a two by, um, two by K design. And to Andy's point, um, making sure that the teams have a, a, a reference there um, because this isn't something that you wanna keep um, in your head <laughs> um, for everything. So making sure that your organization has the documentation available um, to make sure that you're choosing the right tool for the job when you wanna go do that analysis um, so that everyone's not trying to do this discovery by themselves. Yeah, and I also wanna come back to the, the, the previous this, um, comment around not necessarily to, the industry is moving in the direction of R and asking the question, well, does it match SAS? And that's not necessarily the right questions to be asking. And that's not the philosophy of this, of this working group project. Um, and I, to me, 
when we look at what, what's been discussed so far and the outcomes from linear, what's where it's, it's almost all very rosy story of you can match and it, you know, things are very, um, very well defined. And then you look at survival and the key takeaways from there are that um, things might not match, but they're explainable or the change of some options can make them match. So then you have to decide which path is actually the most appropriate for what you're trying to do and to be transparent about that. Here we see a, a completely different type of discrepancy, if you will, in the sense that that the some things that might be available in the SaaS world and within Proc Freak uh, may have different packages that you have to stitch together and you have um, you have to be more aware of what those tools are that are available. And of course, in the open source world, you can also provide feedback and, and, and try and get, get, get um, contribute to that code base, right? Uh, but each, each of those three classes that we've looked at so far have different reasons why we, when you ask the question, how does R compare to SAS uh, and what's the right path forward? And to me, the fact that we're seeing even different reasons you might see different uh, discrepancies or differences between the results uh, is why this sort of initiative and this sort of analysis is really, really important. The industry has never really had to face what does it mean that we might have different languages doing what we think are similar analyses uh, and what do we have to be careful of? And you know, I know, Mike, you and I agree with this and I feel like there are some others in the call that also agree with this philosophy that that the results that we've always had from SAS are not necessarily the single source of truth. It doesn't mean that they're wrong. Small discrepancies, numerical discrepancies may still be as long as the interpretation is the same. And so far, we've, we've seen that, that, that we can do that. Um, I don't know if, Mike, if you want to add anything. Um, well, Aiming, you um, wrote into the chat, you're a panelist, so you can unmute yourself. Do you want to, um, your, your comment was that statistics or statistical assumptions for CMH are important. Um, do you want to expand on that at all? Uh, okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I apologize. I wasn't able to get on the um, picture <laughs> or video. So um, I just want to say, uh, we. Uh, when we got statistic training or in the company also, um, it is when we try to apply something and test some cases, I know we, we test some marginal cases, like extreme cases. But in reality, I think it's kind of fall into the what Mia said earlier. on. Sometimes in reality, the very small data sets mean uh, millions not reached, you didn't use that. For CMH, it's the same uh, story when the uh, what happens when it's very sparse, uh, cell size very small, this kind of thing. We, we need, I think a statistician would, would I trust that they will ask them uh, themselves if the, what's the right methodology, what, what's the right stratification need can be done. Um, what's the justification? Um, so like um, be transparent, lay ahead. Um, specified before you, you unblind in data or something. So that, that's what I'm trying to say um, for any methodology. May, maybe sometimes we, as a testing, we want to test a more package. We want to see uh, uh, SaaS provide a, a lots and lots of things as to how our will different package will, will react. But in, in, in reality, I think for, for adaptation, uh, the first thing we need to ask ourselves, we, what's the right way, appropriate statistics we need to do, we want to do here. That, that's what I um, can think so, of. Aiming, would, as I try and, and, and take in what, what you're saying, would you, do you think that it's fair to say that, that, this, that what we're investigating here and what we're finding in this case within CMH is that, um, there may be some assumptions that we unknowingly made in, in the conventional historical implementation of these. And those assumptions are now potentially being challenged as we see um, the, how, how implementations are within other languages. Um, Michael, I, I, I think I follow you on that. Um, like Mike Stackhouse indicated, um, 
if you, uh, our package may be more sensitive. Uh, it, it could be that just because I'm not writing that package. It, it could be the package considering the general sense how it will be used in the that circumstances, not like everything under the sun. SAS become uh, for many, many years of development, maybe a different a story. Like, like for example, I'm sorry, jump back to Mia's example, offering uh, break ties, offering our um, birth law. Uh, in Merck, I, I mean, in my organization, we, I, we pre-specified like use Ephraim, okay? So it we're not, um, like in SAP, you, you would expect statistical analysis plan, you would expect fine um, assumption, what you are going to use ahead of time. So Mike, I, I, I think I, I would agree. Um, it, it, it just, because in this group, I think Clara designed a lot of cases. Some cases uh, may not be the uh, CMH actually uh, very designed to be used, but we would like to see what's happening there. I, I think as a kind of exercise to push the boundary. So for the reality for, for the team to use, it is always uh, good to know what you are trying to solve and what's the package uh, assumptions, package development. Um, so now, now we're doing statistics. Uh, I think I heard stats always saying, oh, in school, uh, assumption is everything. Uh, statistical assumptions we need to watch out, uh, then apply to what needs to be done. Thank you. Any other um, questions for the CMH use case? All right, so then we can proceed forward um, to mixed modeling. I do want to give um, some credit uh, to Andy Miskell um, and uh, Kai Sun. Um, Andy had a paper in Fuse, I think 2019, that actually was one of the precursors to prompting us to start this group um, because that paper did some exploration um, into um, some of the commonly found discrepancies between um, R and SAS and exploring different implementations. Um, and mixed modeling was one of the kind of key pieces there that um, we've, it's kind of well known that um, it, there are some challenges of getting matches um, in SAS for mixed, uh, or in R for mixed modeling to uh, what is produced through SAS. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Andy and Kai. All right, thanks guys. I think I'm the designated speaker for this one. And by the way, with the 2020 Fuge Conference, um, if people are looking for that paper, the only reason I know that is it was canceled um, three days, you know, three days before because of COVID. It was scheduled for March of 2020 and we all know what happened then, but we were able to do that virtually. And I believe the recording is available online somewhere of that, the presentation for that paper. Um, so as Mike uh, said, we had the proc mixed, um, or not the proc, sorry, the mixed models um, area of this presentation today. I would like to recognize Kai Sun, Doug Thompson, and Soren, and apologies, Soren, um, I don't have your, I forget your last name, um, but for the great help that while uh, the four of us were in this space. Um, so the key phrase that I'm going to have for my sessions today, more work to be determined. This is a huge area, mixed models. I think the more we got into this, the more we discovered how much we did not, did not know. So since in the background, we've used SAS proc mixed uh, to do our mixed models, our ANCOVAs for decades, literally decades. And <clears throat> One of the things we discovered as we got into this is the more questions that we raise, why are we doing this, doing this, we realize, and this includes me as well, because I've done this, I've done this on countless studies over my 20-year career. I'm copying and pasting from the previous study. Why do I use Kenwood Rogers? Why do I use this option or that option? Well, that's what we've always done. And so we started in this question, why are we doing this? We've been doing the same things and are we even doing the right thing? Um, <clears throat> we started testing what our functions can replicate what proc mix is doing uh, to get the same or statistically um, 
similar results. The goal is not to match SATs, as has been mentioned before in this presentation, not to match SATs precisely, but to verify that we're getting, we're doing the same methods and we're getting similar results or valid results, let's say. Not exact, but valid. Um, R handles things differently, floating points. It rounds differently. It does things maybe in a different order, but it ends up at the same place with respect to the validity, validity of the final results. Next slide, please. All right, so before I get into some of the details, just some of the key takeaways, we were able to reproduce um, a lot of the, the, the functionality of proc mix. The results are broadly aligned. Um, they're not exact. Um, and as I said, there's many factors why they're not exact. We did do some analysis. When we did, we did some Bland Altman type plots to sort of analyze what the differences were. Um, <clears throat> we didn't notice any trends. They were sort of randomly, very small, but randomly distributed differences between the two. There was no systemic differences that we found between the lenses. So that was good news. But as I said, there's a lot more research that needs to be done. We had a very small sampling of data. We did not, <clears throat> well, I don't want to say this is a, we took a thousand studies and a thousand simulations. We didn't do that. But based on the data that we had, these are what we've observed. All right, next slide, please. So, and I want to go this very quickly. We can cover this in the Q&A session, but we basically, we analyzed four different R functions to sort of replicate what we see out of product mix. But GLS, we actually did two different things with the LME function, uh, LMER, and then for some of the least squares means, we're actually able to do some EM means, um, use the EM means function, which I know one of the previous groups mentioned as well. Um, <clears throat> You can see the code here on the screen that we used in R, and then at the bottom right corner, the SAS proc mix code. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, we did want to show you one example of some of the output up here. So we do have an example of uh, the log likelihood um, estimates. Um, one of the things that I think we discovered more than anything else in this is the degrees of freedom. There seem to be some differences between SATs and R, even in determining the degrees of freedom. It seems like a lot of the other things are very similar or is that, but the degrees of freedom can have a, an effect on the results, of course. So even when doing the Penman Rogers, we sometimes found some different degrees of freedom issues. That is, again, something that we need to do further investigation into. Um, you can see some of our, our sample size in there at the bottom before we go on to the next slide that we do have three different visits. So we did simulate some, you know, attrition from, you know, from one visit to the next in the study. All right, next slide. Um, and you know, the R results are at the top of the screen. The SATS results are at the bottom. What you see on the left side is for the four different simulations we ran um, <clears throat> with GLS, two with LME, one with LMER, we had very similar results. Or in this case, we had exact results to the third decimal point. Um, <clears throat> and then if you look on the right side, um, we didn't see the, the standard error and some of the other estimates and the p-values. Um, if you look at the bottom, if you were to multiply the four results you get from R1569.053 by minus two, you would get within a couple decimal points the same value you see for SATs. Um, at the same time, if you go over to the right side there, the estimates we get from SATs in this case match uh, almost precisely what we got from R. You look at the estimates, you look at the standard error, you look at um, the p-value. Very, very close differences. All right, next slide, and I, I do want to get to the Q&A, so I'm gonna go through this quickly. Um, we did, we want, we, we have various covariate matrices between SATs and R, unstructured, heterogeneous. We do have a guide here on what the SATs option is and what 
within like let's say GLS or LME or LMER, what the what the um, option name is in there to specify. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio with some of these like heterogeneous first order auto regressive. You do need to use a couple other things like bar ident in order to com be compatible with it. So as I said, it's not a one-to-one -one match in every case, but these are just from the guidelines of where you can start to get the equivalent covariant matrix options. All right, then one more slide before, or two more slides. This one here just shows a very quick example of some of the residual analysis. As you can see, they're scattered around the, the, the zero bar. So we're not seeing any systemic differences. And these are very, very small differences when compared to the actual results. You know, if you were seeing like the 1500, these are, these are small differences. Uh, but just to show you that there's no trends that we observed. And then the last slide I want to cover before we turn it over to Q&A, there is a lot of future work to be done. Um, this is a humongous area. And even going back to not only the humongous area, but questioning, have we been doing the right things in SAS all along? I mean, should why do we always default to Kevin Rogers? Is that the right thing to do? Should we be doing Satterway? Should we be doing some other degrees of freedom estimate? Um, we need to look at what happens when we add in random statements, if we add in random values, or, we, or if we have repeated measures. We have a lot more work to do on this. This is the tip of the iceberg. We also need to test on a lot more broader samples of data, um, bigger sample sizes, smaller sample sizes, to see how everything reacts and behaves in different scenarios. And especially more work is needed in the degrees of freedom area. So with that, um, Kai, I know you're on the line. If you wanted to add anything before we turn it over to the Q&A. Uh, I agree what, you know, some points Amin brought up, you know, there's a kind of two aspects of our testing of this, you know, different languages. You know, we tested like a software, we tried to push it to the extreme and see how the software react. But the other aspect is a statistical aspect. What is the reasonable statistical practice? What's the reasonable range of the data we will see and we can make conclusions. So, uh, there's differences in, in these two areas. So, so as a statistician, we have to be cautious about you know, how, you know, regardless the tool you use. Um, maybe I'll just uh, leave at that. And then if there's any questions regarding our, our work. So does anyone have any questions? Like Michael Remler dropped in the chat, you can either throw a question um, into the chat if you can find the raise your hand feature, um, we can unmute you and allow you to talk. In the meantime, um, Andy and Kai, um, as you've gone through this, um, from coming from a SaaS based world, um, how much do you feel like you've learned about mixed models? Um, and uh, this area as you've gone through R, because when I've taken my dives um, into it and doing things like replicating the CDISC pilot, um, it's certainly my experience is that there's not one place to find um, things related to this method. Um, there's a, a couple different places you can go um, and it makes you ask a lot of questions. Um, so what's been your experience there? Yeah, I, I, as I mentioned, I didn't. I learned that I've been doing things for twenty years, and he, I, not even me, like I may, I'm more on the programming side. I have some stats graduate classes, but I'm not a project statistician. But even the project statisticians, they seem to sort of rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And we, this is what we use on the previous study. This is what we're going to use on the next one. And since learning to know how many. I, I mean, I learned so much, especially on the degrees of freedom, like Kevin Rogers, Satterway, between, you know, containment, between, you know, between within, all the other things. And I knew the options were out there, but I guess I've never really delved into them as much as I did as during this project and <clears throat> realizing how many, how little I question what the model is and the analysis plans that were given. 
Um, and then when we're trying to match R, sometimes, okay, we matched R with SATs, but really, is that should that be our gold standard? Our gold standard should not be matching R with SATs. Our gold standard should be what is the appropriate method for this situation, for this study, or for, the, for this analysis that we're doing. We've been using SATs in the gold standard. Well, this is what we've always done. We, we instead need to be questioning, what's the appropriate statistical method? I don't care. And can we trust the language to do that method? I think that's the main thing. Can we trust the language to do what it's saying that we're doing? Uh, can you go back to a slide on the CDIX pilot examples? Um, that's, that, that will be my I mean, when I learning. Go, uh, go up one more. Yeah. So I go, I go down one more. Okay, there we yeah. go. So um, in this comparison, I learned, you know, um, first you have to kind of understand what the, um, the pro procedure or the functions try to optimize. There is an objective function of any statistical method we, we use. And for the mixed model, um, it's penalized d-square. So they try to optimize the penalized d-square. So if you can get the objective function match, uh, that's a huge step. That means your estimates, beta, or, and your covariance structure could be roughly get to similar places. So if you, could, you couldn't get that to match, you don't have to go down. Uh, I mean, if it's too different, then you, you're probably fitting different things. Uh, and the second step is you want to get the inference of your estimates and what's the most appropriate way most appropriate way to get that. Um, and we know from the statistical history, um, we rely a lot on the um, large sample theory to get the you know, t-test, f-test, te or any approximation, even Kenwood Roger to work appropriately. So um, is that true for your own study? You have to judge on your own. And uh, I think Douglas Bates, his opinion is, you can always do simulations. You can always run a parametric bootstrap to see where where your you know the distribution of your test statistic is, um, and that you we can use that to compare you know what SAS and yeah R whatever language that could be. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, I I think it was from a post of the NL. NLME author. It's either NLME or LME4 that I, um, Andy, I sent that to you um, a little bit back, but um, he was making a similar point like that. Um, but, um, and kind of echoing a resistance to implement um, p values on some of the stuff um, to try to match the output coming from SAS. Um, and he had a lot of concerns um, echoing around that. Um, but that's going back, I think that post was from back maybe towards 2006, or it was years ago. So um, discussions um, of R versus proc mixed are quite old um, at this point um, too. Anyone else have any questions? Any other points in? Uh... So Yousef um, said in the chat, the algorithm used in SAS to minimize the objective function is quite optimized with some approximation in case of H being not greater than zero, while in R it's not, this could lead to some discrepancies. I think that kind of echoes your point, Andy, um, that you've, you're at the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Anyone? it's particularly insights like that that, that Yusuf is making that we're trying to, to uncover. Um, and it's, I mean, it's trial by error. It's trying to take a, what these, these um, use case subgroups are trying to do is to, in some sort of regimented way, start to isolate where we might see discrepancies, why we might see those discrepancies. Um, not to provide the answers, I think that's a, a, an, an after effect, but to help us understand as practitioners what questions we should be asking. So if we were in a different class of models than one of these four, or we were looking at a different language that was implementing one of these, what types of questions might we look at, at least under the assumption that it might be similar to, to these use cases? 
So is the edge any, referring um, in the uh, question regarding to the covariance structure? Um, is that referring to the uh, the covariance structure to have, should have may have you know singular um, type of conditions, and then the SAS could potentially handle a little bit better than R. Yeah. Oh, the Hessian. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that related to how algorithms is implemented, right? A lot of stats procedure is implemented as the second order optimization function. So the Hessian was used. Um, it doesn't mean all the first order approximation will give us the wrong results. So I, yeah, so just more and more research, more research need to, mm -hmm. uh, need to put down. And if you have, you know, trouble fitting data set, um, please um, send it to us and we would like to see. Yeah. All right, very good. So I think at this point we can move forward to the closeout here. So Rimler, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, great. So this is our, uh, our, our, our last slide and, and, and we, um, I mean, thank, thank you everybody for, for joining and listening. I think what we wanted to do here was um, in this last section is, is, is try to motivate you sort of a call to action. This is not, I mean, it is a fused working group and you can get involved with this. So we do have the white paper that's, that's currently in development and, and you, do, you could contribute to that, um, but we have that, that team lo looking, looking to put together the framework itself. Um, those typically go through a number of different types of review cycles, one of which is a public review cycle. So when you see that come out for a public review cycle, which might not be until later in the next year, um, you know, please do give us your comments and, and, and your feedback on that. Uh, I think the, the quickest way to, to get involved is by reviewing that, that pub, what's out there in the public code repo, which is linked here as well. Um, as we said, like we, we started the analysis by saying, let's look at some very popular use cases where the results out of those use cases could drive real value for people and understanding the differences, questions that haven't been asked before. Um, but to learn what types of discrepancies you might see on two different implementations of the same statistical model um, across two different languages. And how does, we haven't yet asked the question how those things might translate uh, and expand across to other languages or, or other, um, other classifications, but that is where, where we think we can go. And we would love to hear what, what your thoughts are around, you know, do we think that the, there's value in going deeper into the existing use cases, although we've obviously identified that that's the case within mixed models. Um, moving to new classes of models, what are other types of analyses that we typically do within, uh, within pharma that's not captured by one of these four where we might, we might learn more um, about, about differences or expand to other languages as, as folks look at um, uh, other, uh, other languages for example, Julia or maybe Python and that, that sort of thing where you might see different differences for, for lack of a better term. Uh, because ultimately, I think uh, a lot of the, the folks on the team, uh, as well as, as others that we've talked to, really are questioning, you know, what is the right statistical implementation? You heard this from, um, from people in, in, in each of the different presentations of let's not do what we've always done. Let's ask what should we be doing and if what we should be doing based on sound statistical principles is, uh, is implemented in R by default, then even if we were to implement in SAS, we should be thinking about setting up those models uh, and those options so that it's the, the, the sound statistical model. Maybe we want to, we, if we're in a SAS, we want to match R, maybe in R we want to match SAS, or maybe it doesn't matter because their implementations are still numerically close enough that the interpretation of the results is consistent and, and that's sufficient. Um, these are types of questions that we don't think have been asked or answered before. That's what this working group is trying to do, to deliver a framework for what types of questions uh, might be important to ask when, when, when faced with these problems, but also to develop this, um, this code. So you, 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 uh, Andy and Kai were talking about um, some of the additional type of work that 
might be able to be done within mixed models. Whether you're a part of the working group or not, you still have access to the repository and, and you can pull request some of those things in, or you can uh, reach out to, to Mike or myself or even Lauren, you can get directly involved with the working group. This is an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, I think that uh, as we continue to move in this direction, uh, we're gonna find that we, we need to learn more and more about what differences matter and what differences don't matter and what differences can be reconciled. Uh, so ultimately we're actually performing the right analyses on the data uh, to, to get medicines to, to patients uh, with, with quality insights. So thank you very much. The slides will be shared out uh, and Mike has put the, the, uh, the repo in the chat as well. Uh, we hope that you found this useful, uh, a, a valuable use of your time and we wish you uh, the happiest of times as you finish out your year and we head into next year. Mike, any last words from you? Nope, um, just that this is a large effort. Anything that anyone can contribute, we greatly appreciate. Um, to echo Andy's point, we have a lot of evolution on that we can do, Andy's point in the chat that is. Um, we hope, or the content that we've been producing, we want to evolve into a book down site so that it's easy for people to find re um, related information on these different things. Um, so that you have that kind of resource that you can go to to say, this is what I'm trying to do. These are the considerations that I need to make. Um, and uh, so it'll be evolving. So just keep your eyes peeled in 2022. And um, I hope that if your organization is going down this route, that you can encourage them that this is a public effort. Um, and this is something that everyone's trying to do. So you're going to have findings. If you can share that back with the community, um, through um, your efforts to adopt R or open source languages. Um, it, this, these are hurdles that we all need to come across. Um, so if we share that information, it puts less burden on your organization to, um, to take that information back in house um, and you can save others effort as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great day.